this is Meredith Elliott Powell, and you know what time it is. Time for Thrive, the show where we dive into the strategies, discuss the steps, everything that you need to know to turn uncertainty into one of your greatest competitive advantages. Now, I've got a dynamite guest here today. He is all the way jet lagged coming to us from Dubai, the introvert's edge legend, Matthew Pollard. Welcome to the show, Matthew. I'm ecstatic to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm ecstatic to have you because we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects. And it's a conversation you and I have had quite a few times before, and that's the importance and the power of your network. And you have a little bit of a different take on it that I think will be great uh, for the audience today. Matthew, for those few people out there that don't know you, tell us a little bit about your background and the interesting story about how you found the Introvert's Edge and how you found the power of the network. Yeah, absolutely. I I think that one of the things that most people believe is that introverts can't sell, we can't network. And, you know, I I really had an interesting history that kind of found that that introverts actually make the best salespeople, the best networkers. And if if I didn't lose my job just before Christmas, if I (laughs) If I didn't find my way into a commission only sales role that really I got I, I got no sales training, just five days of product training and told to just go out and spew out jargon to customers, then I really wouldn't be where I am today. So I, I guess you would say I was unluckily very, very lucky. And for me, when I started going out and selling, you know, I remember going to my first store and, and getting told to go and get a real job, which was always my favorite because it was the only job I could get. I, I got sworn at, I, you know, I just got told go away and, you know, door after door that just kept happening until I got to my, my 93rd door where I made my first sale. And I, I remember I made about $70 and I, I just, I had this realization while, while I was ecstatic for about 45 seconds that I had to do this tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I, I think for a lot of people, they kind of just accept that that's the way it is. We rely on lady luck and we're like, okay, tomorrow I'll be lucky. Maybe the next day I won't be. And we don't really change anything because everybody just thinks that sales is a natural ability. You either have it or or you don't. And if I have accepted that, my year would have been terrible. So for me, I, you know, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. So, you know, I remember being the slow kid. I remember you know, feeling really uncomfortable. I had really bad acne. So sales definitely wasn't where I needed to be. (laughs) But I thought to myself that if I'm going to do sales, I'm definitely not going to be defined by this so-called gift of gab that I didn't have. So I went looking for a sales system. And I, of course, didn't look to books because, I mean, I had a reading speed of fifth grader. And this was before amazing podcasts like yours, Meredith. And so what I did is I really just gravitated to YouTube. And as a punt, really, and not expecting to see much, I typed in sales system and all these videos came up and I was blown away at how many people at the top of sales were talking about the fact that if you follow a methodical process, both introvert and extroverts, by the way, were saying if you follow a methodical process, you can truly be successful in sales, in networking and, and in business. And I went, you know what, I'm going to follow these people because without that, my year is going to be terrible. And so I would spend eight hours in the field applying what I'd learned, eight hours back at home practicing, weekends I'd spend 16 hours practicing. And while I know this probably doesn't sound exciting to anybody, it sounds probably horrific, it was tough. Within six weeks, everything changed. I went from closing a sale you know, every 48 doors to every 36, to every 21, to every eight, to every three. And about six weeks in, my manager pulled me aside and I thought I was in trouble because I was the quiet guy that handed my paperwork in downstairs, didn't really talk to, to anyone upstairs. And they were talking to me and, and they shared with me that I was the number one salesperson in the company, which happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. And I, I think that what I discovered is that the reason why introverts are terrible at sales is because we've all fallen victim to this delusion that you have to have this gift of gab. But yeah. yet some of the best in the business, including you, including I, including, I mean, Zig Ziglar, the most well-known sales trainer on the planet, we're all introverted. Yet, and when I look at extroverts, people like Jeffrey Gittemore, a good friend of both of ours, you know, he will also share that it was when he discovered a methodical process that he started to succeed. And so through my work, it's applying methodical processes to sales, to networking, to public speaking, to leadership. And it blows my mind anybody that just does any of that unplanned. Because just like anything, if you have no plan, yeah. those that plan um, that that fail to plan, plan to fail, and it, it just proves its its case over and over again. 
How, what do you think it is though about us resisting a methodical um, plan? You know, cause I'm, I'm sort of the opposite at the beginning. I was like, I don't need a plan. Like, leave me alone. This is ridiculous. I was having a level of luck. I mean, I was born into a family where I didn't like it, but my mother made us network from the time we were little kids. She told me it was my responsibility. When I walked into a room, if somebody didn't have a friend, I was supposed to go up and talk to them. And it turned out to be one of the greatest gifts anybody ever gave me because then I always had the connection when I got into sales, I could get in the door. But boy, it was when I, I I think all of my success is based on methodical process. When people ask me how I do things, I'm like, I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not smarter than anybody else. I'm not more talented. I am just consistent that more consistent than probably 99% of the population. So where do you think the resistance comes in? Because it, there's, it works. So why don't we do it? You know, I, I think that's interesting. So you were told as a child to go and be, make friends with somebody. Yes. And while you perhaps resisted planning at, at a later age, what I, I think that would have come down to is that you would have practiced and practiced the best ways to approach someone at a younger age, which is why to you it came across as natural ability. And one of the things I struggle with all the time is people that say things like, oh, I, I, I used to be introverted, but don't worry, I'm extroverted now. Like that's even <laughs> possible. I mean, you can't change your personality style. I mean, for me, I speak from stage. I love networking. You know, I'm the guy in the business class suite, suite that sees people walking around and I will make a statement like, finding the right place to see it, it's an important decision, right? And the yeah. person will laugh and then we're having a dialogue, but that's a practiced thing. So I think for, for a lot of the people that would say that, it's because they see introversion as a, as a bad thing. And because of that, they, they wanna become more extrovert. And I, I think you and I have both found that leaning into our introversion, our empathy, our understanding, our ability to listen actually allows us to succeed. I, I think what, what happens though, is the extroverts out there, they, they resist planning and preparation because they can survive without it. And it, yeah. it, it takes time, it takes work. I mean, for me now, every time I have to learn something new, I still get that anxiety, I still get that frustration, I still wonder whether it's worth it. And then I'm always so glad that I was, I was methodical. And I, I think that's the thing. When, when we leave school and education is no longer forced upon us, more often than not, we wanna just let life be simple, right? We want right. to just do what we know. And I think the more and more we fall into that, that, you know, that comfort zone, the less the magic happens for us, the less we evolve, the less we get better. So I think that it's actually more dangerous for extroverts. And that's why I believe that introverts have the edge when it comes to these, these specific skills like networking and sales. It's because that we introverts are terrible at those things by nature. So we will gravitate to methodical process and then we'll hold on to it for dear life where an extrovert will, they love the fact that they can wing things. So even if you give them a methodical process, they then want to gravitate back to winging things for two reasons. One is their ego in a lot of ways is attached yeah. to the fact that they can. And then, and then secondly, planning and preparation for a new sale to come. I mean, you see, it drives me nuts. How many times you pick up the phone or get on a Zoom call with someone trying to sell you something and their response is, I'm so glad we can get on a call today. Tell me a little bit about your business. I mean, my number one response is, oh, I'd love to. Tell me what you've seen on my website and what questions yes. you have and I'd love to answer those. And you get this explosion of their facial expressions because they've just been caught out. They did no planning and preparation. Where I like to say, you know, um, you know, I'm glad we could get on a call today. The customer will say me too. And I'll say, well, while I've had a chance to look at our previous dialogue, I've checked out your website, I've checked out your LinkedIn profile. Well, a lot of that is static and it's been a while since we scheduled this call. So what I'd love to do is take a step back, hear a little bit more about you, what you're struggling with and how I can be the most help to you in the time we have together today. As soon as I say that, you see this instant relief with the customer. Oh, thank goodness. I don't have to baby <laughs> this person. You get this halo effect of they see my time as, as important. They've done their prep. So let's start from here. And the deal closure rate goes through the roof. Yeah. It's, nobody likes to plan because it takes effort, but they don't understand how much effort and energy it takes to not plan because they're dealing with every day. That's just the state of the state of play for them. And I, I just choose to reject that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, when I was coming up in sales, you actually got rewarded for winging it. I mean, you kind of got the pat on the back because you were so good 
you could wing it. And we kind of made fun of people who had to methodically plan. Now I look around and I don't know what your experience is right now, but um, most sales teams and most sales professionals that I'm dealing with are struggling in the virtual world because even though things have gone back to in-person, you can get an in-person meeting. Nobody wants to talk to you if you're winging it. I mean, nobody wants you in there. So I've had an audience um, member uh, uh, chime in, Rick, and Rick is asking, he's got no sales process. Where does he start? Yeah, so I mean, so firstly, to go back to you, to your question, yeah. so when you're uh, winging it used to be the thing that people could do, because I remember people would walk into a meeting and they would spend like an hour and a half on small talk and just being, you know, having this loud personality. And then they get to the last 30 minutes, like, oh, we, we better start, you know, talking about the product, right? But at that point, they had the person in the palm of their hand and the person would be willing to buy anything. These days, you get a 30-minute Zoom meeting. Yeah. Now, like, people are much more controlled over, you know, we're more efficient. We, you've got a 30-minute slot. So if you're not selling in that 30 minutes, I mean, relationship is important, sure, but we use things like storytelling to develop and foster rapport, and you know, which is scientifically proven to work amazingly well for us introverts that hate small talk. It's perfect, <laughs> but you know, for when you're when you've got thirty minutes, you best be talking about the application of the product. You best be fostering rapport as part of the sales process, not prior to it. So because you just don't have two hours anymore, people. Are, 30 minutes, we're done. So if I was going to, to step back to Rick's question and say, okay, how am I going to start a methodical process? And what I would what I would suggest is sales is not like martial arts, right? Learning multiple strategies and mixing them together is a is a combination for disaster. You know, I've had people that, you know, post you see this on LinkedIn all the time. I've I've read a hundred books this year. And my question is, well, that's great. Well, how many how many of you applied, right? <laughs> right. So it's pointless consuming information if you're going to apply. Um, you're not going to apply it. So the thing that I would really highlight to people is that what you need to do is find one mentor or one system that works for you. And I mean, I learned on YouTube, so I'm not saying you have to buy a system or read a person's book, but what you've got to do is find a single system because what I would like you to do or suggest that you should do is follow Henry Ford's kind of process for manufacturer. You know, when he, what he suggested is, you, know, you remember the saying, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black because he right. doesn't add any of the bells and whistles. So what's interesting is, you know, my book on sales, The Introvert's Edge to Sales, one of the things I say up front is there's nothing groundbreaking in this book. It's that I'm putting a methodical process yeah. together that's been proven to work and that works for us as an introvert and will help you get over those mental hurdles. And that's why it's gone on to, to sell over 50,000 copies and it's in 16 languages because it doesn't have the bells and whistles. What it's done is it's given you that blueprint system. And you know what I like to say is this book is a lot of ways a gateway to a lot of the other books that are that are talking about all the bells and whistles. But the problem is that, especially for introverts, when you find a system that has bulldog techniques and hard closing, it doesn't feel congruent. So that's why my book has done well. But I don't think, you, you don't need to say, well, that's the book I'm going to read. What you need to do is say, I'm going to look for one system, one solid base system that I'm going to learn that takes me through an A to Z of getting to a sale. I'm going to completely blind myself to the fact that there are anything else out there and I'm going to follow this. It's almost get the widget off the line and yeah. follow the bumpy steps. Now, for an extrovert, that will actually take a small back step because you'll actually feel that you get worse at sales before you catapult forward. For an introvert, you may think that perhaps it makes you feel a little bit less authentic because you're used to not being great at sales, but at least what you're doing feels natural. But what happens and what I've found is that introverts, when they step back and follow a sales system, they stop having to worry about what to say as much, which allows them to be more present in the sale yeah. and allow them to ch really channel their empathy and really actively listen more effectively. So again, it doesn't, I, I know it, it would make sense for me to say, well, you've got to follow my system because my system is going to mas massively get you to double your sales. But what I really want you to understand is it really doesn't matter what system you choose, as long as it's a methodical step-by-step -step process once you've got that nailed, then look for the things you can bolt on for accelerating that process. But at the start, it's really about taking a step back and saying, okay, I need a system. This is a system. Let's use that. Yeah. I also think that I think, see, the thing that I love about um, your system and I love about uh, 
of the book is I love the idea that I've long agreed that the introvert truly does have the edge because sales is about listening. It isn't about coming in with this for, you know, verbose personality and, and just kind of overwhelming um, the sale, although that does, you know, work on occasion. The other is there is no instant gratification. And it amazes me that in all the years and in all the books that have been sold and all the systems that have been sold, people are looking for the magic bullet. I'll never forget. I had a speaking engagement um, last year where they they told me everything they wanted. I went through, I outlined it. We discussed what, what was going to, uh, to happen. It was their first in-person one in a couple of years. And they came back and they said, everything looks fabulous. This is exactly what they want. But could you give us the magic bullet, the one thing that's guaranteed to work? And I just laughed and I said, no, there is no magic bullet bullet in sales. It is about the consistency of putting, you know, of really putting all the, um, all the steps into place. But somebody else asked, you know, they have a system that's being, they quote unquote shoved down on them by their sales leaders. It doesn't feel good. So when you were finding your system and you put together, you know, you're looking at these YouTubes, I'm sure you came across systems that were like, I I have no interest in, in doing that. What is this idea of finding a system and how important is it to find one that works for you? Well, it, it is incredibly important. See, one of the things that I always struggle with was those kind of hard closes. As a matter of fact, I think a good close should be one that where you really don't ask them to buy, right? Because that's never been something that's comfortable for me. And I always found that, you know, if, and actually I will say this, that if you get to the point where you feel like you have to close the deal, to me, the sales systems let you down. And mm -hmm. so what I will tell, tell you though, is there are some extroverts that love asking for the sale and they take pride in that. So there's nothing wrong with having a system where you have to ask for the sale or choose to ask for the sale. But if it's not congruent with you, then you should absolutely not be doing that. So when you're looking for a system, it is vitally important that you find a system that works for you. I will say though that Frequently, when you when you see salespeople reject a sales process, they then don't come back and say, but I'm going to use this one. Is that OK? What they're often going to say is, I don't find that that process or this structure of a script or this story is going to work for me. So I reject that. But then they don't do their homework. So they don't come back and say, I'm going to do this instead. Is this OK? Or I've molded this sales process to fit this structure, is this okay? So what I would suggest is if you have a top-down push for a sales system, what you need to do is find a system that works for you, mold what they've already given you in to that system, and then pilot it to get it to work. And then go back and say, I hate to say it's easier to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission, but what I would suggest is spend the time doing the hard work. As, as you heard me say, I spent 16 hours a day practicing and rehearsing and actually delivering my new sales process. But in six weeks, I went from having no business being in sales to the number one you know, in this company. And I went on to be responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories, leveraging that strategy. So I wouldn't give back the time that I spent, how terrible it was for anything because it led right. me to where I am today. But I went from nothing to being the best in the business. So what I would suggest to you is it won't take you anywhere near as long as you think to, to gravitate to a system that's going to work for you. So I would suggest pick up a couple of books, read their introductory paragraph. Most of those you can download for free. Like mine, you can download the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com because for me, I feel that I've got to get you over that barrier of you believing that you can sell as an introvert and then outline my process to show you that it is something that you can feel comfortable with. And I, my belief is that every author does exactly the same thing. Otherwise, it's probably not the book you want to pick up. But when you when you do that and you feel comfortable, then read on. And my belief is that within weeks, you can apply that process and make sure that it feels comfortable and then go back to your boss saying, I've struggled with this process. However, I've tried this and you've noticed my sales go up and here is why. I don't know a manager in the world would go, no, go, go back to the process that wasn't working for you. Yeah. So I'm true. I mean, nobody cares. Nobody cares how you get there. They just care at the end of the day that you got there. I really want to encourage listeners to go to theintrovertsedge.com. I downloaded um, the first chapter of your book uh, a while back. It's really good. It really entices you to... Um, uh, you know, to read the rest of it. I, I want to flip into where your pa where your passion and where your focus is now, and that's really on storytelling. So there you are. You go from you know bottom of the barrel to you're the best 
in the company. You start training salespeople. You go out on your own. You really have this methodology in this system. When did storytelling start to appear for you as something that was important to the process? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that story, I call it the heart of a sale. It's, it's the heart of a networking conversation as well, because I think that if, let's just face it, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, technology organizations, finance companies, people in the medical world. And the number one issue is that somebody gets into a sales process and then all they do is spew jargon out at the person in the hopes that they'll understand it and see how it applies to their business. Well, I got news for you. If you're in those industries, they don't understand how it applies to their business. So what I looked at was what would be, not to say the silver bullet, because I believe that a solid sales process is something that you can't just overlook. You can't just jump to one tactic, one strategy. But what I focused on was most organizations, if you say adopt an entire sales process, it's like moving the Titanic. It's, it's really hard for an entire organization to shift gears and start to move across to something. So what I decided was that storytelling would provide the highest ROI uh, event for a sales team because it, it, it's really not that complicated. Instead of spewing out jargon, what you need to do is say, what's our one sales play, our biggest focus right now? Or maybe it's to get to more of a consultative sale where we get paid to analyze your entire situation and then provide the best suggestions for your organization, the best implementations. But what I learned is the best way to get people to understand what you do was through storytelling. Simply for an introvert, you know, it's scientifically proven that when you tell a story, it activates the reticular activating system of our brain, which creates artificial rapport, which we introverts are really good at deepening rapport. But also when you're getting into such a short, concise sale where you don't have time for small talk, it allows you to, for the person to leave the call feeling like they've developed a relationship with you. On top mm. of that, it's proven that people remember up to 22 times more information when embedded into a story. And then wow. thirdly, it short circuits the logical brain, which by the way, is the part of the brain saying, that'll work for me, that won't for work for me, I don't have time for this, hang up the phone. To it short circuits the logical part of the brain, you speak directly to the emotional mind, which is the part of the brain that just yells out story time and it just listens to all the information in the story, assumes it as fact and is listening for the moral. So if the moral is we work with someone just like you and we got them to an amazing result, we can do that for you as well, then the customer is more likely to listen. I mean, we did yeah. try this in real estate and we got people from an average eight seconds on the phone in commercial real estate with C-level executives to two and a half minutes because we'd get to an objection wow. And you, instead of hitting them with logical fact, you'd start telling a story. And they were mind blown. They're like, no one's going to listen to a two and a half minute story. Well, not only did they, appointments quadrupled and it took months, not years, to trans completely transform that business. So story, in my mind, if you're looking for something that can create an ROI event to really double down on the rest of the process, story is the right fit. And that's why I speak at a lot of uh, global organizations and I talk about emo what I call emotive storytelling or the three-dimensional story because organizations they think they tell stories but it's more like watching a, a documentary or we reading the white paper <laughs> it's horrible customer wanted this so we gave it to them my in my mind a story delivered in business should be exactly like the story of how you met your partner you know it starts off a little bit bulky perhaps there's some things you remove to be honest if you're talking about the story of how you met your partner there's likely a few things you embellish on too oh of course but over time, it becomes a bit of a theatrical masterpiece, right? Like I know the story of my wife and I and how we met now. You know, I say certain things. My wife says other things. You know, <laughs> we, we say some things together. We hold hands and we're like, so that's how we met. Yeah, in business, we don't do that. And that is the mistake that we make. In every single story for every business, there's a decision maker that was worried about losing their job, was excited about getting a promotion. Small business, you've got people that are spending or doubling down on the, the the fact that their business is going to succeed and they're terrified of spending their kids saving you know their college funds on keeping it to survive there there are always these hugely emotive stories and i've seen it with gym franchises that forget to mention that the reason why the lady in their case study was trying to lose weight was because she was trying to get pregnant how is this not part of the story or a tech right. company that said, you know, if it ain't broke, we ain't going to fix it until the server goes down just before Christmas. And now David's the guy in the story that ruined Christmas for 2000. <laughs> right. Nobody introduces this. So storytelling done well means that the customer will see themselves in the story and see you as the only logical choice. So that's why I think it's the biggest driver when it comes to getting people to make large decisions and make them much quicker.
Yeah, what I love about this is it's really you get the process down first, right? You know what you're going to do. And then storytelling is that is that level that you lay into it. I feel like when somebody tells me a story, when I'm in a sales situation and they're selling to me, they get me. I I understand in that that they understand the challenge that I'm facing because they can relate it in a story to another customer that has felt exactly what I felt. And then they told me, you know, how, how they solved uh, that problem. Like it's, you know, the person was in the same gutter that I'm in. They got the person out of the gutter and now the person's successful. I don't know. There's something in there that's not only emotional pull, but makes me believe more that you can help, um, that you can help them. Well, there's a few really powerful things in, in what you just said. So the first thing is that instead of reading a brochure and saying that'll apply to me, that won't, you're hearing about a story and you're like, oh my gosh, I want what Wendy has, right? Yeah. So you feel it, it becomes tangible and you don't want to give it back to them. So because of that, you you actually have this ability, you know, they say when you're selling, for instance, an iPhone, hand them the iPhone and then ask for it back and they won't want to give it back to you. Well, when you tell a story, you know, a lot of times when we're trying to sell a product, it's an intangible thing. They don't really understand how it applies to them, where if you build this three-dimensional story, they can feel the person in the story and they feel the victory and they don't want to give it back. So that's huge. But the second thing is that if I tell you, hey, Meredith, I really think my product's going to work for you. Here are all the reasons. You can choose to disagree with me. However, if I tell you a story about Wendy and the, it, just in the story, Wendy had all these things happen to her. These were the wins. These were the things that went wrong. And we got that we held her hand through the entire journey and we got her to a successful outcome. You can't disagree with Wendy's experience. So because of that, the, the part of the brain that's skeptical in a lot of ways switches off. So you walk away saying, well, Wendy had this experience. I believe that I, I, I can get to where Wendy is because they've done it before. Right, So it does create that level of trust. And again, the reticular activating system stimulating rapport throughout the storytelling process allows us to see us like them. And, and as a byproduct of that, people are more likely to buy. But then on top of that, yes, the tangibility of it. So you've got all of these scientific fa factors. I mean, as you know, we've been telling stories since the dawn of time, yes. the relationships. Stories are by far the number one thing that's going to motivate the sale. But again, in business, if you tell it as a case study, that's not a story. If you, if you, right. if you try and explain that, and you'll see people that try and do, deliver a story in 45 seconds, and it's just a list of dot points, that's not going to work. What you really have to do is tell a story that is designed that, to entertain, engage, share the emotions. And for that, you need a couple of minutes to tell a story. And if you believe that people aren't going to listen to a story that long, try it once, you'll be blown away. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. It's hard to believe, but we are about at the end of this podcast. I've had another. Um, uh, I want to close with two things. I've had a uh, another uh, listener chime in with a great question that I don't I don't want to leave without uh, without answering. So answer this question and then tell us what we need to do to get the introvert's edge to learn more about storytelling, to follow Matthew Pollard, to tap into everything that you're doing. So here's the question. I'm in financial services and Matthew, I know you work a lot in this uh, arena. What is a sales process for us? Please remember that people are buying us. They're not buying um, uh, the product. Well, so firstly, let me answer that question by saying they're actually not buying you. They're buying, and they're not, they're definitely not buying the product, that's for sure. Yeah. But they're also not buying you. They're buying their belief in you. And story is the best way to convey that. So what I will find, especially in financial services, is you feel that it is your job to educate the customer. All you're doing is hitting them with a fire hose of information that, trust me, they do not appreciate. Now, sure, you can build some rapport elements around it, and you might be the least confusing or the nicest person, so they may choose to work with you. But if the worst, the, the least bad salesperson of financial services is your aim, that's not where I would start as, as where I want to head. So what I would recommend when you're looking at a sales process is, firstly, these days, people like you to come prepared. So go back to the script that I mentioned in the, in the earlier part of this recording to highlight that you have prepared and then highlight that you are here for them, i.e. what I would like to do now is take a step back, hear a little bit more about you, what you're struggling with or what your financial goals are and how I can be the most help to you in the time we have together today, highlighting that you're there to serve them, not sell them. Now, in the financial services specifically, 
you are a commodity in a lot of ways. And the reason why you feel like they buy yeah. you, is they don't see a difference between everybody selling it. What you need to do is learn that if you niche down, so you work on a specific group. You know, when I work with people in the financial services space, they'll say to me, you know, every customer is my customer. Well, that's the problem. As soon as you say, I work and specialize with this group, then all of a sudden you can have these really great stories that perfectly explain a situation just like the person you're talking to has. So I would highly recommend a few things. The first thing is I would recommend niching down so you become the only logical choice and your stories perfectly articulate the problems of your ideal client. The next thing that I would do is, is help you understand that a sales process is just a framework. Your personality still fits in it. You just structure it in a planned and prepared way. A lot of extroverts will go into a sales conversation. They're just happy to chat, right? They yeah. run out of time and they don't get people to the close, close the deal. Now, there are more introverts in financial services than any other industry outside perhaps technology and medical. So what I will tell you is that you will then use jargon as a crutch. You're saying you want to educate them, but what you're really doing is you're trying to feel comfortable with what you know. So what I would suggest is leaning into a sales process that gives you that framework and then practicing what you're going to say at each transition point, including uh, the story. And, and to your point, Meredith, I mean, you can do that by following yeah. the framework. And there's actually some really great stories in financial services in my new book, The Introvert's Edge to Networking, which you can actually get the free chapter of that at theintrovertsedge.com um, forward slash networking. So I got that one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the red one that I'm showcasing at the moment, right? So the difference is white cover versus red cover. Yeah, simple, but you but you need them both. All right, Matthew, tell us how to uh, to find out more about you, find out more about uh, your programs, and to find out more about networking as well as sales, as well as uh, probably I feel like some of the most important is the work that you do around storytelling. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Uh, so I would suggest, I mean, I put a ton of content on YouTube. And the reason I do that is I learned to sell watching YouTube. So I'm repaying the debt by putting a ton of free content out there on LinkedIn, on all social networks. Uh, for those people, though, and I will, I will say, I think the biggest issue that we have in sales and business in general is what I call busy procrastination, right? We keep consuming more and more information, but we don't actually do the work. So I would, I would highly recommend checking out you know, either book at theintrovertsedge.com or theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. Don't pick up both because that's busy procrastination. Pick one of those two books, download the first chapter, read it. And then, I mean, I say with the sales book, if you just grab the seven steps of the sale, look that's at what great. you currently say and fit what you in, into that seven steps, you'll realize there's some gaping holes, probably around telling great stories, asking great questions. You'll also realize there's some things out of order and some things that don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. That's usually the jargon. If you do that, you'll double your sales in the next seven, uh, you know, seven to 14 days really, really easily. Um, in regards to storytelling, yeah, I provide a, a ton of presentations on the topic of storytelling. And the reason I do that is because I think that most people overcomplicate it and think it's going to take much longer than it does. You know, when I deliver storytelling presentations quite frequently, you know, I'll bring somebody up on stage and I'll get them to tell a story and then we'll transform it in minutes. And the only reason I do that, and I will tell the story back to them in a way that they wish that they could tell it after asking them just a few questions is just to prove that it can happen in minutes. Because my biggest milestone with, with organizations is helping them realize that this is operational within days, not months and years. And I think that's the biggest hurdle. So if you're listening to this and you're, and you're in sales, you know, there are videos that I have online of story transformations. Go watch one because the trans the changing of your belief system, that sales systemization yeah. or just introducing story is something you can do within hours, not days, not months, is really, really important because otherwise you just go back to busy procrastination. Read another book, tell yourself you're moving forward. And that's the last thing I want for you. Oh, Matthew, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to download this, make it available, uh, put all of the information we talked about in the show notes today, but I feel like we have scratched the surface. So as we go down the line, I'm going to need to have you um, back on as a guest for more conversation, especially around the new book, uh, The Introvert's uh, Edge Guide to Networking, as well as more about storytelling. And we'll see all of you for another episode of Thrive. And together, we're going to learn how to turn all of this uncertainty into a major competitive advantage.